All of these need pre-exposure, or rather post-exposure protocol that we went over, don't they? But you want to know who's more concerning, don't you? You want to, as a nurse, understand we all get needle sticks. Now, which one are we going to freak out over? Which one are we going to be like, oh, I have to really be extremely worried about this one? How about your staff? What kind of needle stick was it? Trust me, all of them get the same attention. But I feel a lot better when I'm comforting my scrub nurse than I do the lab tech. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, so when you look at this page, you can see it talks about safe injection practices. And for the life of me, I cannot believe how many schools are still teaching recap the needle. I almost want to die when I hear the schools are still teaching that. We stopped teaching that 15 years ago. Okay, you don't recap a needle for nothing after it's used, okay? Now, in this section, obviously it has it on there, do not recap the needle, but I had at least three LPNs in the last time I did this course that told me their teachers told them to recap it because they can't walk through the room with a needle like that. Raise your hand if your school taught you that garbage. Yeah, look around. Wow. <laughs> Y'all don't think I, I mean, really, y'all think I'd be what, talking shit. These schools crazy. You do not recap a needle. Because once you do that, that's when you get stuck. Common sense, okay? That some of the teachers don't have nowadays. Now, the other thing is you want to put on your little note, vacutainers put you at the most risk. Vacutainers are when you draw blood. Suture needle has the lowest risk. Vacutainer highest risk of exposure. Suture needle lowest risk. Be very careful, nurses. We obviously discard sharps in a sharps container but you are going to be working with impaired people all over the place. Your anesthesiologist can be impaired, your coworker nurse can be impaired, your physician can be impaired, although it's highly likely that the anesthesiologist or the nurses are typically um, who you see a lot of times because they have the most exposure to all this medication. Your physicians don't have as much exposure because they're writing the orders and you're doing it. So when you have impaired nurses, they steal the sharps container they get the fentanyl patches out. They get the little leftover, tiny bit of leftover out of the morphine uh, container, uh, uh, glass container. Stealing sharps containers is pretty popular. So you are trying to gauge when you're somewhere working in long-term care. I was just here yesterday. This lady don't get but one shot a day. What's going on? You really have to think about it because it's crazy. You're going to see the strangest things. We have nurses taking the fentanyl patches off the patient, putting gauze and covering it up, taping it over like it's a fentanyl patch. We have that a lot. Okay, so you need to understand it's really bad. Okay, the other thing is if you're in home care, you should be teaching the patient to discard their needles into detergent containers or milk gallon containers, empty milk gallon. I personally prefer the soap detergent containers because they're opaque, you can't see straight through them, like Tide and All and Cheer and all that. Uh, Arm and Hammer, you can put it right in there. You can't see through that, so it's a lot less of your business out there. But of course, uh, you do, you can use a milk container, you can. Just something plastic. Hand hygiene, we've already discussed that. You need to put 15 seconds. Protective barriers, we discussed that. So we're going really fast. Most of this stuff we've talked about. Okay. Then it says consider all bodily fluids to be contaminated. So that would be standard precautions. Standard precautions. Avoid contaminating the outside of specimen containers. I want you to highlight that, and I want you to remember 
when pouring liquids, the label is in the palm of your hand. When pouring liquids, the label is always in the palm of your hand. So if I was pouring, let's say this was normal saline. The label needs to be in the palm of my hand. Why am I pouring with the label in the palm of my hand? Why am I doing that? Yes, the solution can pour down the label, and now I can't read what is going on here on the label, and if you have some type of hazardous exposure, you're going to have to be able to read the tiny little print. Okay, that was on um, the exam for you. So you're trying to put the label in the palm of your hand. Now at the bottom it says clean up bodily fluids immediately, then cleanse area with germicidal solution. Please put this. 1 to 10 solution bleach, 1 fourth cup of bleach, 2 and 1 fourth cup of water. So this is just review, a lot of this, very quick review. Some of it is new, but this page is a lot of review. So 1 cup of bleach, I mean 1 fourth cup of bleach, 2 and 1 fourth cup of water. That's a 1 to 10 ratio for that. Okay, now the next page is very, very, very important. This is your medical asepsis and surgical asepsis. As you know, with surgical asepsis, we call it sterile technique. With medical asepsis, we call it clean technique. Ain't that right? Okay, now, when we look at both of these techniques, I want you to remember it depends on where you are. If you're in the home versus that, God bless you. If you're in the home versus the hospital. If you're in the home, what things are sterile in the hospital that are not sterile in the home? And I need three. Dressing changes, trach care, uh, and insulin injections. Uh, now, which one was wrong? Dressing changes. Dressing changes are sterile no matter where you do them. It's Foley insertions. Now, I get from my students every time I do this, dressing changes. And it usually is because you've watched some loser do a dressing change and they did not maintain sterile technique. This is why our patients are dying. If it wasn't sterile, why cover the wound? When you pulled that 4x4 four four out that pack, it was sterile, i.e. sterile technique. When you pulled it out of the pack, you should have used sterile gloves. Your colleagues didn't. This is why people are dying. Dressing changes are always sterile, even if I do them on the rooftop. They're sterile. You have colleagues. You will see them never done sterile gloves, and they're doing a dressing change. That's why it is a focus area. They are supposed to use clean gloves to remove the dressing, don sterile gloves to dress it. But yet and still, every single one of you have probably seen just crazy technique. So again, the three things that are sterile in the hospital, but not the house. Urine catheterizations, you can use catheters more than once. Trach suctioning, insulin injections. Now, when it comes to this handout, I want you to add a whole lot of extra. And practically speaking, everything is going to be talking about sterile technique. Now, when we talk about maintaining sterile technique, remember everyone, anything below the waist is contaminated. Anything behind me is contaminated. 
when we open sterile equipment, we open the first flap away from us. We open the sides and the last flap, which is how it's worded, is open toward us. Isn't that right? And then of course we hand it off to our surgeon or whoever, whatever we're doing, or just put it on the field like we're doing. Okay, so when you open things, you have to remember the very first flap, and usually the best example is a Foley catheter packaging. You open the first flap away from you, the last one toward you. You guys know this already, but I'm making sure you really know it. Okay, then if you're doing a surgical hand scrub when we're preparing to go into the OR, you need a minimum of two minutes, and we keep our elbows flexed. So going into the OR was part of my weekly ordeal. And so I do my hand scrub, two minutes, three minutes, whatever, at least two. And then here's the kicker. When I dry my hands, this is how I do it. I don't do this. Elbows flexed, hands up. My hands stay up, although nothing is on them right now. And then I prepare to go into the OR. So when I'm walking into the OR door, I turn around and I back into the OR door and turn around for the nurse to put me in a gown. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's very important. Once you open any container, it is only good for 24 hours. So you must date and time the container that you open, you personally opened. It's only good for 24 hours. After that is considered contaminated. The preparation of anything you do in nursing that requires that we pour sterile liquids. Believe it or not, sterile saline, all of these things, they are poured before sterile gloves are put on. And that's why we have a circulating nurse in the OR, because it would never be appropriate for me, scrubbed in, to pour anything. So the circulator is doing all this. She can have clean gloves on all she wants, but she cannot be pouring liquids with sterile gloves. And you're going to remember that because it's a big one, okay? So you don't pour anything with sterile gloves on. You don't do that. Okay, next page. This is when things get a little bit more complex for you to understand because we're going to add a lot of stuff to this page as well. Now, the title of the page is a little deceiving because we're not going to use it for that, but we will touch on it for about five seconds. You heard Dr. Jones talk about cellulitis and osteomyelitis and yada, da, da, da. Well, during the time you were at lunch, one of my nurses who graduated in November from this class, she had failed the test. She's so funny. She's like, I failed with, she told the crew that was here at lunchtime, I failed with Busta, so whatever. But anyway, she came to say hi, Lana. Uh, Lana, I don't know how ironic this is, but she told a similar story to me about her home care patient with the diabetes, with the osteomyelitis, with the cellulitis, well, cellulitis first, osteomyelitis, all of the whole thing, she just told me, the lady has pick line, she's getting the antibiotics, she was septic, yada, yada, I mean, really crazy. So uh, when Dr. Jones and Lana are speaking, she said it was just like you teach us, straw. At the top of this paper, put straw. Because I don't know whether you're paying attention or not, but Dr. Jones gave you straw. And Lana came in and talked about straw. Straw is S-T-R-A-W. 
and it is a wonderful mnemonic. It is the mnemonic for three things. Inflammation, infection, and DVT. What's the S? Swelling. What's the T? Tender. What is the R? Red. Red. What is the W? Warm. And depending on what's going on with the patient, if it's infection, then the A would stand for antibiotic. If it's a DVT, then it would stand for an anticoagulant. So inflammation, infection, and DVT all have the mnemonic straw. Yes, baby? I don't have that thing. What would you do, pick up two of the same? No. Oh, how funny. Nothing in there has got this on it, honey? It was just the second page, guys? Oh, okay, so hers just was missing in action, huh, baby girl? Okay, sweetie. Let me make sure this one has it. Shelly be doing shady stuff. Yeah, pass that down to her. Okay, so infection, inflammation, DVT, all have the mnemonic of straw. You have to know this because that's when it's going to spur you into action. Now, if you look at this, there's a different mnemonic. I don't like it, obviously, because I use the same one for three things. But it's saying exactly the same thing, isn't it? Okay, saying exactly the same thing. Now, on the left side, you have lots of room. I need you to put chain of infection on that side. The left margin, you can go right on down. You can put chain of infection, and I'm going to teach you what we mean. And it does matter in terms of a real person. The first one is called a reservoir, reservoir or portal of exit. Reservoir or portal of exit. When I told you about Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, the portal of exit was the camel. When I told you about the new STD, the portal of exit was a mosquito. It could be anything. It could be a human being. It could be a tick on a deer. It could be anything. But it is your portal of exit. The next one is a mode of transmission. The mode of transmission could have been droplet could be contact, could be, as in the case of the mosquito, vector-borne, could be, in the case of a bird, aviary. So it's just a mode of transmission. Obviously, the big ones for you are in columns. OK. Next is a portal of entry. For Ebola, it was mucous membrane. For nurses, it could be your IV site. For you and me in a class like this, <laughs> it could be our nose and our mouth breathing in crazy. Somebody sitting near us hacking. So that has to be a port of entry. For STDs, case in point, it's a vagina, it's a penis, whatever. OK, so you get this. I mean, come on now. This one is the most important. A susceptible host. And don't just write host. You better be writing susceptible host. As a nurse, you are naturally paranoid. You took micro, you saw bugs, you did cultures, you're freaked out. You're neurotic. You wash the color off your skin. You don't eat at buffets. We know that. But you have to bring yourself down to regular people for a minute. What nurses and doctors even don't necessarily understand or even grasp, it's hard, is that every exposure does not turn into infection. So I have had plenty of times a female with gonorrhea, 
or chlamydia or both because they travel together. And she has a boyfriend that doesn't have it. Of course, he's happy with that. He's kind of accused her of everything, okay? Or by the same token, I've had my patient sent in by their boyfriend because they were told appropriately to have your girlfriend treat it. And so they called me up, told me this guy has every crutch right known to mankind, and I need to be treated, Shelly. And literally, I will test her. Obviously, I'll treat her anyway. But I'll test her. She'll be negative. My cousin allows me to tell you this incredibly miraculous story. She's my patient, so I can testify on the Bible that it happened. Her first partner died of AIDS. Her second partner, we're preparing for the wedding in April. She's been with them for two years. We're preparing for the wedding in April. In January, he walks in and tells her, twice now in her entire life of 40 years, he's positive HIV. She did not use condoms with her partner, fiance in one case, boyfriend in the other. She has been negative for 14 straight years. She was not a susceptible host. What makes you susceptible? Your freaking immune system. What builds that? Your freaking diet and level of exercise and level of stress. So if you eat like garbage, you a couch potato, only exercise you get is some damn thumbs on your phone. <laughs> and your stress level, nursing students, is way up here. You done failed the test three times. Somebody promised you a job. It's a deadline on the job. You got to pass the test. Your boyfriend acting crazy. Mama took you out the wheel. Kids call six and six kids. Because you ain't paying them one of them any attention. Rightly so. Yeah, that's called stress. That's called stress. And stress will kill you when it comes to your immune system. So you have a woman here who's had two lifetime partners with AIDS. By the way, that man died last year. So they're dead. These sons were, were her stepkids. She was with this guy long enough to develop a beautiful relationship with the kids. They're both dead. And she remains negative. And it's been years. I mean, she's, she's neurotic. I don't blame her, do you? She want to be tested every 15 minutes. I'm like, fool, you ain't been with nobody for five years. I'm going to need you to stop asking me to keep testing you. Fuck that. I don't know how the hell I'm alive. Test me. Oh, you know what. <laughs> so my point is, not every exposure is going to result in an infection, and you care about that because you have a tendency to freak out with your patient. Oh my God, he touched me. I'm going to need you to stop. He breathed on me. Jesus. Well, he does have a right to breathe, last time I checked. Okay, so stop it. All right, now, what also boosts your immunity? This little puppy right here. I didn't take it because I didn't like the smell. I don't know how weird I am with that, but I didn't like how it smelled. Echinacea. Echinacea builds your immunity. However, it is not recommended that you take it longer than eight weeks. You're just taking it every day and she ain't going to do nothing. You take it for seasonal coverage, usually in the winter months, for a good eight weeks. It boosts your immunity and it's an herb. It's not a, a medication, it's an herb. And a lot of people that really get sick in the winter take this. And so you had to know that. Okay, on the right hand side of your paper, or if you use the right, the left, you want to put for this one, stages of infection. Stages of infection. 
this is a whole nother subject, stages of infection. What I want you to remember through each and every single stage, your patient is always contagious. So don't look at one stage and say, oh, they ain't really contagious. No, every one of these stages that I'm going to give you, your patient's always contagious. Stage one is incubation. We talked about that. We said it was between the level of exposure, the time of exposure, and the time of positive clinical symptoms. Do you have any signs and symptoms in incubation? The answer is no. It's incubating. You have no signs and symptoms. Sometimes we call it latent phase. And it's very, very tricky because students hear latent and think late. It's not the same thing. Latent and late is not the same thing. In fact, latent is probably more early. So incubation stage is just cooking, but you don't know necessarily that you have anything because you don't have signs and symptoms. Okay, so that's period of incubation. What's the period of incubation for chickenpox? 14 to 21 days, okay. Next is prodromal. Prodromal stage is a vague kind of flu-like illness. You have seen many things start out when we talk about it as flu-like illness. Not every infection has a flu-like illness. Not every infection goes through a prodromal stage. Prodromal, really like not that sick, but sick enough to feel like, oh, I'm coming down with something. Now listen, that whole prodromal stage, if we can catch our patients in the prodromal stage with the flu or bronchitis or a bad cold, and we take zinc, or some of you may say, uh, what is it, Zycam, then we can get right back out of it. So I don't get sick because I'm neurotic about this funky prodromal stage. As soon as I get a scratchy throat, me and Zycam got a love affair. Me and Zinc is going on a date because I'm not trying to get sick. I can't afford it. Y'all tests depend on me showing up and I don't miss school. Okay, so I got to take something. Isn't that right? As a nurse, you need to get up close and personal with zinc. And you got to remember, you got to eat first. Don't eat after. So you eat first or your stomach will feel funky. Eat first, but don't eat after. And you don't chew it. You just let it melt in your mouth. You swallowed it, you fucked up. You got the flu whatever your little problem you have. You swallowed it, you didn't even do what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to let it just melt in your mouth, okay? Everybody need to go by that. It should work real well, okay? Who tried it? Oh, tell me, baby. Like candy. You keep it with you. Who else tried it? It works like crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. It'll make you throw up. It sure will. You got to eat before. Little Nancy nurse tricks. When we teach people to take this stuff, tell them how. Okay. All right. So here we go. Illness. That's the third stage. Full-blown illness. Now that's common sense. Severe signs and symptoms. Number four. Period of decline. Now you're starting to feel a little bit better. Yesterday was hell. Today is less hell. Starting to feel a little bit better. Now, put a star by this one. This is where antibodies start to form and do really well because you've survived whatever it was. This is the formation of antibodies at this stage. So when you're in the period of decline, you're winning the war. Your antibodies have formed against whatever was infecting you. And then the last one is convalescence. Convalescence. Convalescence state is recovery. No more symptoms. You start to feel better. 
Repair and Recovery. Turn the page. <laughs> 